Read God's Word. Let's all stand this morning in honor of the Word of God. 2 Samuel chapter 11. Pull my notes out here. 2 Samuel chapter 11. This is a, uh, a message that I had uh, done in Sunday school for my teenagers. And so uh, if, it, if it sounds like I'm preaching to teenagers, you know why here. So I'll incorporate this. But it's a great truth. We're going to uh, read here verse number 1. The Bible says, And it came to pass after the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. And it came to pass in an evening tide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the, woman, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And David sent and inquired after the woman, and one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And David sent messengers and took her, and she came in unto him, and he lay with her, for she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned unto her house. And the woman conceived and sent and told David, and said, I am with child. And David sent to Joab, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite, and Joab sent Uriah to David. And when Uriah was come unto him, David demanded of him how Joab did and how the people did and how the war prospered. And David said to Uriah, Go down to thy house and wash thy feet. And Uriah departed out of the king's house, and there followed him a mess of meat from the king. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and went not down to his house. And when they had told David, saying, Uriah went not down unto his house, David said unto Uriah, Camest thou not from thy journey? Why then didst thou not go down unto thine house? And Uriah said unto David, The ark and Israel and Judah abide in tents, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are encamped in the open fields. Shall I then go into mine house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? As thou livest and as thy soul liveth, I will not do this thing. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we sure do love you. Thank you for the wonderful day that you've given to us. Thank you, Lord, for, again, the opportunity to get a chance to preach the Word of God. Lord, I ask that you please would help me this morning. I know, uh, uh, Lord, I'm an unworthy vessel to be able to preach the, the Holy Word of God, and, but I thank you, Father, for counting me worthy and putting me in the ministry and ask, Holy Spirit, that you please would speak through me and use me, uh, not for my glory but for thine, and that, Lord, our hearts would be touched and that, Lord, a truth would, uh, Lord, be revealed and that, Lord, the Christians here would grow. Lord, if anybody's here this morning, Lord, and maybe they don't know if they die that they go to heaven 100% sure, they don't know that they'd be with you in heaven, I ask, Holy Spirit of God, that you speak to their heart. That's the greatest answer to prayer that I could ever have, that, Father, from a message that is preached, that somebody would get saved and that, Holy Spirit, you would touch their heart for their need of salvation, their need of a Savior. Pray for the, uh, the Christians in this room as well, that, Lord, the truth of God's Word would help them to grow. And, Lord, we would leave here and be better Christians because of it. Lord, we sure do love you. Thank you for everything that you've done that we don't deserve. We love you. Ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. We, re we find here in 2 Samuel chapter 11 a very familiar uh, portion of Scripture. Uh, if you've been in church for any length of time, uh, you probably will recognize the story about David. And uh, if you're not uh, familiar with it, David is a very famous man in the Bible. You, uh, the entire... Well, not the entire book, but uh, most of the book of Psalms uh, was written by David. And, and you go in there in, in, in the in First Samuel, Second Samuel, First Kings, and, and a lot of those. A lot of that is all about this the life of this man named David. He was a king of Israel, and uh, the best king of Israel. Uh, in in my concern, he did so much for, and and he brought Israel to what we would say the heyday. Uh, of the kingdom and, and what they were doing for the Lord. And, and uh, he just, uh, an amazing man to learn from his life, to learn from his character. And, and his love for the Lord is what draws, I believe, many people to him to say that he's their, very char their, very, their, their most favorite character in the Bible. Uh, David's love for the Lord, David's uh, uh, tenacity to, to do what's right and, and to not give in. Most people know the story of David and Goliath. It's this same man here that stood up to the, to the giant and, and, and called him down and said that the battle is the Lord's and defeated the giant. And so he's also a very famous man in, in Israel, uh, very well known, and now at this time very wealthy as well. The, Israel has prospered, the kingdom is doing great, and uh, I, I, you could say it was kind of like the, the, uh, the uh, America of that day where the, the, the country's 
knew Israel. They and Israel was uh, trading, and they and and they just continued to produce. And and uh, what an amazing man that David was. But we find that even David is as great of a man as he was and as great of character that he had, still had his faults. He still had to keep himself in check. And we find here an unfortunate story in the life of David, that one I believe that as he sits in heaven and, and he sees that we read and, and see his life, I believe that he wishes he could go back and change it. You know, it's in God's Word. David will always be, this will always be in the Word of God. This will always be uh, something that for us to remember. And I don't think that David enjoys that, but he made a mistake that I believe that we can learn from. You find at the very beginning what it was is it's the time of year when the kings were to go forth to battle. But instead of going to the battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him. And you look there at the end of verse 1, but David, but David tarried still at Jerusalem. If you'd like to give the, uh, the message a title, I would call it the danger of tarrying. The danger of tarrying. David, it says, tarried still at Jerusalem. He stayed behind. He decided not to go. For whatever reason, he decided to tarry. He decided to wait. He decided to be idle. He decided to sit. He decided to remain and dwell where he wasn't supposed to be instead of going and, and doing the job of a king. And we find, and we go to verse 2, it was in the evening, in an evening tide, that David arose from off his bed. Boy, he's been in bed a while. I know uh, I enjoy that sometimes, you know, you get to sleep in. I work UPS during the week, and so Saturdays and Sundays are my days off. And, you know, anything past 3.30 is a blessing for me. You know, I have to get up 3.30, you know, go unload those packages and, and slave and, uh, you know, and things like that and, you know, get home and, and uh, I go, I go, and so on the weekends when I get to sleep past 3.30, I think, praise God, you know. And so, you know, David, for whatever reason, he's, but I've never slept, I think, till the evening. And uh, you know, not that long. Uh, uh, my brother has, but not me. And uh, don't tell him I told you that. But, but he, he was, it was just the evening tide, the Bible says. And David arose from off his bed. You know, funny how that when, you, when you're idle, uh, you don't do anything. You know, that's what idleness is. He was on his bed. Uh, you know, why are you in bed in the evening time? You know, why was David lingering in his house, just wandering to and fro? You look there, he walked upon the roof of the king's house. Uh, he went somewhere pointless. You know, David went to the roof. You know, why the roof? Why would he, you know, why go somewhere where a pointless destination? Why be in bed all day? Why go to the roof? Why do nothing? You find that, and then from the rooftop, uh, the rest of the story where David commits adultery. And what a sad thing it is in the life of David. And let me say again for maybe those that are new or maybe you don't know, but adultery is wrong. Adultery is sin. And the reason this is a big deal is because it led David to sin. Anything outside the bounds of marriage is still sin. And I don't care what America's Supreme Court says, adultery is wrong. And I'll be the first one to stand up when America, uh, when we begin to go uh, to prison for preaching, I'll still be the one to stand up and say, adultery is wicked and wrong. And David committed sin. But I believe that David committed sin because he tarried. Because he tarried. He made a mistake in that he tarried. He was idle. In a Christian's life, it's easy to be idle. It's easy to tarry. The principle here is when you know where you should be and you're not, the devil has an opportunity to strike. David was not where he was supposed to be. He was not doing what he was supposed to do, and he ended up doing what never should have been done. When God tells you where you ought to be, don't tarry. Don't stay behind. Don't be idle. When you're supposed to be running for God, don't sit on the sideline. 
when you're supposed to be doing a work of God, don't stay home. When you're supposed to be in church, don't stay home. When you're supposed to go soul winning, don't stop and do and watch the TV or don't stay and, and do uh, everything else besides what God wants you to do. Work for God, amen. The Bible says it's a race. We should be running the Christian life, not sitting from the sidelines and watching everybody else do the work. Some would rather tarry and watch everybody else do the work. But it's those that tarry. It's those that stay behind. It's those that linger and become idle that the devil's after. The devil's after those who work. But as we know, uh, a famous statement, an idle mind is the devil's workshop. This is why I preach this to teenagers. I told the teenagers it's easy to become idle in your life. It's easy to become uh, uh, it's easy to become idle in your mind and idle in your Christian life where you sit and you watch everybody else but you allow yourself to wander. You look there, David, he was on the rooftop and he looked down and he saw the woman washing herself. And it says, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. David began to let his mind wander, I believe. David began to let his mind go where it shouldn't go. But he did that because he was idle. He wasn't doing anything else. He allowed himself in his mind to wander. Oh, dear Christian, don't tarry in your life. Don't linger. Don't wait. Don't be idle. Let me give you some things here. Not the points of the message, but I believe in everybody's life, something not to tarry about. Don't delay to make a decision about Number one, your salvation. A lot of people tarry in this decision about being saved. They hear the word of God preached. They hear the call of the gospel. And many tarry and decide, well, I won't make that decision yet. I'll just tarry a while. I'll be idle about this decision of my salvation. Let me call to you today and, and tell you, don't tarry in deciding to trust Christ as your Savior. Are you saved this morning? Are you born again? That's the most important question that I can ask as a preacher of God's Word. Are you born again? Do you know that if you die that you'd go to heaven? If you don't know that 100% sure, don't tarry in Jerusalem about that decision. Make that decision for God. Trust Jesus as your Savior. If maybe you've never heard this before, but I give a call to you that everybody is lost and we're sinners bound for a devil's hell, but you can go to heaven through Jesus Christ. Make that decision today to trust Jesus. Don't tarry at Jerusalem in this decision. Lots of people will die and go to hell because they decided to be idle about trusting Jesus. They came to a church and they sat in the service and they heard the word of God preached and they heard the preacher give the gospel and they said, I'll wait till later. I'll not go yet. I'll not make that decision. They, be, they were idle about salvation. Don't be idle in your life about salvation. If you know the Holy Spirit's dealt with you, make that decision today. Don't die and burn in hell because you decided to tarry. Don't die and go to hell because you decided to be idle about salvation. Number two, don't be idle as for Christians in your service. Don't be idle in your service for the Lord. If you know God wants you to do something, give your life to God. Don't be idle. Don't tarry. Don't wait for God. Don't wait to do something for God. Start serving God now. Do something for God now, even if all you can do is take a handful of gospel tracts and go and, and give the gospel. Do something. Find a way to serve God. Find a way to give God your life. And don't just allow your family to tarry and allow yourself to just sit down at Jerusalem and sit on your bed and not do anything till the evening comes. Because the Bible says there comes a time when no man can work. When the evening comes and lots of Christians are sitting around and it's getting close to even tide in this world and Jesus is going to return and many are just tarrying in their Christian life for service for God. I preached this, uh, taught this morning about faith. And God's going to come and He's going to find, and He's looking for faith. But are we tarrying in our faith? Are you tarrying? Are you just saying, well, I'll, I'll wait till tomorrow? I'll be idle for now. I'll not make a decision. I'll remain. I'll sit. Don't wait. Don't wait about salvation. Oh, dear person, today 
Don't wait on salvation. And dear Christian, don't wait about service. When you tarry as a Christian, you're unproductive. He rose off his bed. He wasn't doing anything. Christians that tarry are Christians that are unproductive in their life. They're not doing anything for God. You're not giving God anything. David was unproductive. Amen. He, wasn't, he was in bed. He wasn't at work. He wasn't doing what he was supposed to do. Uh, you know, a lot of times at 3.30 in the morning when you get up for UPS, you go, man, I wish I could be in bed. Then I remind myself, well, you can't make any money in bed. So, you know, that's a motivation, amen. I'm, I, I don't want to be unproductive because, you know, my wife has got clothes she wants to buy. So I can't be unproductive, you know. She wants to spend money. Amen. I'm the only one up here saying amen. Oh, buddy, I'm in trouble. No, I'm just kidding. But you've got to be productive. Don't just lay in bed all day, so to speak, in your Christian life. Be productive for God. Don't go to a... What happens is, you notice, and just something that I thought about when I was looking at these verses, and and I taught it to the teenagers, I noticed, number one, from the verses there, he was unproductive because he he got off his bed, but because of his unproductiveness, he went to, as I said, a pointless destination. You know, when you just tarry in your life, you're just unproductive you you don't do anything for God it takes you to a pointless destination it takes you're not you're, you're going to go somewhere where you just wander Proverbs chapter 7 is uh, talking about the, the the woman and about the young man that just wanders the streets because he's not doing anything he's not looking a way to be productive and the woman finds him and 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 draws him into sin but I believe it's because he was unproductive and it just takes him, it took him to a destination where he shouldn't have been. Pointless. Why go there? Why do that? And Christians do the same, where we begin to get unproductive for God. We're not at the church when we're supposed to be. We're maybe not soul winning or focusing on giving the gospel and we wander in our life to pointless destination. And God goes, what are you doing there? Why are you doing that? And then what happens, you go to a, a pointless destination, and you find you get led into sin. Can I tell you, a bar is a pointless destination. Can I tell you, the movie house is a pointless destination. You know why? It doesn't bring productivity. It doesn't produce anything in the Christian's life. It doesn't give you anything to help you in the service for God. It's pointless to go there. It's going to drag you into sin. It's going to drag you into where you shouldn't be and drag you out of church. But many Christians end up there because they're not looking to be productive for God. It's pointless. Addicts are that way. They have an addiction because they, were, they went to a pointless destination. They went to the rooftop instead of going to battle. And then it leads to, and it leads to sin. When you tarry, in your life, you have a possibility of ending up in sin. Now, not everybody does. Some people stop before they get that far. But when you tarry, when you decide to wait, when you decide to begin to hold back, that's when the devil takes an opportunity to strike. Tarrying will lead to a result of sin in baggage in one's life. The hurt and the damage in others and becomes even worse in your family. Let me say that again. Caring will lead to a result of sin and baggage in your life, and then it will lead to hurt and damage in others, and then even worse in your own family. David, we find it the result of his the, or this tearing that he did led to the sin, and it led to the death of the child that was born as a result of his adultery. When you fall into sin, when you tarry and you allow yourself to fall into sin, God has to punish. And it even results in sometimes your family. That's why it's important men not to tarry. It's important for us men not to stay back, but to lead our families, to lead our churches in serving God. Because if we tarry and we fall into sin, it hurts our family. David hurt those around him. And even if you read there, if you're not familiar with that portion of Scripture, go down in 2 Samuel chapter 11. 
where he gets Uriah, which is the wife of this of Bathsheba, the lady that he commits adultery with. And he calls him back home to try to cover up his sin. And he even tries to get him drunk. Man, I never thought David would do anything like that. I never thought that David would allow himself to not fall into sin just for himself, but to try to cause others to sin. You know, when you tarry in your own life, you begin to try to find other people to help you. You begin to try to find other people to help you justify what's going on. And you even will try to sometimes cause other people to sin. David tried to hide it. And then you continue to go down, and Uriah was a man of great character. And he said, and he said as we read, as I live, at verse, the bottom of verse 11, he said, as thou livest, and as thy soul liveth, I will not do this thing. That's what David should have said. David should have said, I won't do this. But he tarried. And Uriah had greater character. And David said to Uriah, tarry here today also. Uriah stayed. And at the end, the Bible says, you go down there, verse 15, and he wrote in the letter saying, Set ye Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle, and retire ye from him that he may be smitten and die. And it came to pass when Joab observed the city that he assigned Uriah into a place where he knew that valiant men were. And the men of the city went out and fought with Joab, and there fell some of the people of the servants of David, and Uriah the Hittite died also. David killed a man because he had greater character than he did at one time. All because... David decided to just tarry. Just once. Just once in his life he decided to tarry. And Christian, just once in your life does it take to decide to hold back. Just it takes once in your life to decide to tarry and not do what you should for God, for the devil to get in and cause you to sin. If you're lost today, it just takes that one time where maybe the Holy Spirit's calling and you tarry to make that decision and you don't know what could happen when you leave the doors of this church and you just decide one time to wait. And then it may be too late. Let me show you something. Ezekiel chapter 16, verse number 49. Ezekiel chapter... 16, verse number 49. This is referring to Sodom and Gomorrah. One of the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah that is well known is sodomy, but look at what else. Verse 49 says, Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Pride, fullness of bread, and what? Abundance of idleness. The problem with Sodom that they had so much sin is because the people were idle. They allowed themselves to do nothing. They allowed themselves to be unproductive in their life. They allowed themselves to just do nothing with their time. And when you allow yourself to just be, to to not be busy, to be idle, to remain, to just to sit, Your mind begins to wander. Your heart begins to wander. And the heart is deceitful and wicked above all things. Who can know it? 1 Timothy chapter 5 verse number 13. Another verse. 1 Timothy chapter 5 verse number 13. And with all they learn to be idle. Wandering about from house to house. And not only idle, but tattlers also. And busybodies speaking things which they... Ought not. Paul is instructing Timothy, helping him to understand that some people in the church learn to be idle. And as a result of their idleness, they become gossipers. They become busybodies, it says. They become tattlers, speaking things they ought not to. You know why? They learn to be idle. Don't allow yourself to learn to be idle. Don't allow yourself to learn what it is to do nothing. 
It ought to drive you crazy if you're sitting at home not doing anything for God. Don't allow yourself to be okay with complacency and be okay with apathy. Don't allow yourself to just learn to be okay with doing nothing for God. No, it ought to drive you crazy as a Christian that you just sit at home and do nothing. You ought to want to do something for God. Get in your Bible. Get in prayer. Do something. Give out a gospel track, amen, and allow yourself to be busy for God. Don't let yourself learn to be idle. That's what's happened in a lot of the young people in today's generation. They've let themselves learn to be idle in front of a television screen playing video games. They've let themselves learn to be idle, being unproductive in their life when they need to be doing something for God. Am I against playing games? No. We played the Wii the other night, and I uh, beat everybody in a three-point shootout. That was a lot of fun. I, I beat everybody. I'm still the remaining champion. Anybody want to challenge me? I'll take uh, challenges after church. And uh, right there, all right, I got one, so we've signed them up. Am I against those things? No, I'm not against fun, and I'm not against good times. But when you ought to have read your Bible, when you ought to have prayed for the day, and you're playing a game that's unproductive, that's idle from what you should have been doing. Because that's what happened with David. It's not that David sinned by staying at Jerusalem. It's that David was where he shouldn't have been. David wasn't in sin because he stayed at Jerusalem. David didn't fall into sin because he wanted to be in Jerusalem. He was in sin because where he should have been was where he wasn't. The problem in our lives is a lot of times idleness is a result of we're supposed to be somewhere, but we decide to do something else. That's what idleness is. Idleness is the unproductivity when you're supposed to be somewhere else. It's not that you shouldn't have family time. It's that your family time shouldn't be on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. It's not that you shouldn't go out and enjoy maybe a night of bowling. But it's that you shouldn't do that on Thursday night when you're supposed to be soul winning. Or whenever your church has a soul winning time. Whenever your church decides to go out and witness for the gospel. Whether it's Saturday, whether it's Thursday, or whether it's a time that you do it with your family. It's not that you shouldn't enjoy a, a Wii game. It's that you shouldn't do it when you're supposed to have read your Bible. That's what idleness is. It's putting off what you should be doing to do what you want to do. Amen. Idleness is what leads to sin in most people's lives is because they've learned to be idle. Let's look at here. The sin of tarrying. The Bible says, He that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. It's a sin to tarry. It's a sin to do, not do what you know you're supposed to be doing. God says you know to do good. You know to serve the Lord. You know to be in church. You know to give God your life. You know to do those things. When you decide not to do it, it's a sin. When you decide to not do what God tells you to do, it's a sin. The problem of tarrying. The problem of tarrying is you become unproductive. You become complacent in your life. And then you look at the result of tarrying. It leads to sin. How do you avoid being idle? How do you avoid this? How do you avoid being in sin? Let me give you some things to. To help you. Number one, be where you're supposed to be. Amen. Just be where you're supposed to be. Look what happened in, in you go back to 2 Samuel chapter 11. Let me turn back there. 2 Samuel chapter 11. Give you some principles to help. 2 Samuel chapter 11. Look where it says, At the time when kings go forth to battle, in verse number one, that David sent Joab. Don't send somebody else to do your job. A uh, dear friend here is a manager at Chick-fil-A. If, uh, well, not manager, you know, the, anyway, he, he runs the place, you know, he gives free food to anybody that wants to after church. And he said, and because they're closed, so, huh? Well, they're closed, so he can sneak in, get us all chicken sandwiches, and uh, I'll take mine, a number four, with a large fry, and a Sprite, brother. And uh, that spicy chicken will tear you up, but it's good. Whew, I love it. Anyway, but be where you're supposed to be. He, if he tells somebody to do a job, then he expects them to do it. 
But if they send somebody else to do their job, they get in trouble. Because he didn't tell them to do it. He told them, cook the chicken. Do, run the cashier. I work at a job UPS. If I decide to have somebody else do my job and me be the supervisor now, they're probably going to let me go. Because God's given you a job as a Christian. God's given you a command. Maybe you uh, work at the church. Maybe, maybe you, maybe you want to clean. Maybe you want to be a janitor. Maybe, maybe you, God wants you to do something and, and, uh, and, and, and you know you ought to do it. Then you do the job. Don't send other people. Maybe you have a job that you do right now at your church. Be where you're supposed to be. Be there and do your job. Don't allow yourself to become idle and sit back and say, well, somebody else can do it for me. David sent somebody else to do it. David decided to one day to miss it. You know, the one day he missed. That one day you miss your bus route might be the day somebody could have been saved. That one day that you miss doing something for God may be the day that God wanted to use you to do something. That one gospel tract that you decided did not hand out to, to just be idle this one time and, and not be a witness for Christ could be the chance that you, somebody missed to, to be saved and was going to be a missionary. You never know what God has. Be where you're supposed to be. Be in church. It could be the night that God speaks to your heart and, and reveals His will to your life. Be where you're supposed to be for your family. It may be the night a, ch a child gets saved. It may be the night that maybe it speaks to your child's heart. It may be, be just be and where you're supposed to be and don't send somebody else to do your job. But he sent other people. He sent his servants. He sent Joab. So he had no accountability. He didn't have anybody there to answer to. And even a king needs accountability because we're all flesh. Even you need accountability. You may have been in church for years, but you need somebody to help keep you accountable in your life. That's why it's good to be where you need to be. Be at church. Be soul winning. Be where God tells you to be. Be in your Bible. Be in prayer. Be with your wife. Be with your family. Why? Because it, it produces accountability in your life. David sent somebody else. Don't send somebody else. Don't count on other people to do it. Number two, don't allow for idle time in your life. Very simple. Be where you're supposed to be. Just do the job that God has for you to do. And then don't allow for idle time. Don't allow yourself to just sit and do nothing. Make goals. Everybody does New Year's resolutions. How many of you uh, have broken already? I did. <laughs> and uh, we all make our New Year's resolution. But then we allow for idle time. Don't allow in the Christian life idle time. Don't allow in yourself to be time where you are unproductive when you should be doing something. Don't allow it. Parents, don't allow for the kids to maybe miss a day of Bible reading. Don't allow for the kids to miss the time at church uh, except for, you know, there's times of uh, sicknesses and things like that. But don't allow for idle time. Don't, don't let it be known that, well, we can get out of it this one time if we sweet talk dad. Or don't allow maybe for your own self to, to think, well, this one time won't hurt. No, don't allow it. Make, it a, make it a priority to do what you need to do. Be busy for God. Be busy doing something always for the Lord. Keep yourself accountable to God and to your pastor and don't allow for idle time. Teenager, don't allow to be idle in your life. Don't allow your mind to wander and just to go where maybe it shouldn't go. Be busy serving God. Be busy memorizing the Bible. You say, oh, I've got nothing else to do. Then read the Bible, amen. Pray. Don't allow for idle time. Number three, I already mentioned it, but don't let your mind wander. A lot of times Christians end up in trouble because... You let your mind wander. David went to the rooftop and sat around, checking the place out. Wasn't where he was supposed to be. Looks down, sees a woman. Do you think that what happened was, and I know there's everybody here we understand, do you think he just looked down and said, oh, that's a pretty lady. I'm going to go commit adultery. 
No. I think it took time. I think he sat there a while. I think he thought on it. He meditated. And I think the Holy Spirit had a battle with him. What are you doing? What are you thinking? And then David thought, well, maybe I can get away with it one time. But you know, if he, was, if he had his mind where it was supposed to have been, and he wouldn't have been there. He wouldn't have thought about that. That's what happens, men, in our minds. If we're not careful, our minds tend to wander towards sin. Why is that? We're all sinners. We all live in flesh. We're all still made of this. Your mind will naturally wander to sin. You ever been walking somewhere, and all of a sudden you go, where did that thought come from? And I'm... Grew up in church. I don't. I mean, I. I. You know, I've not listened to you know uh, music outside of the Word of God. I've not been. You know. Uh, you know. I've been always try. You know, my parents have always kept us sheltered from things of the world and and things like that. And I still find myself going, where did that come from? You know, what 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 thought was that? You know, where did I see that at? You know why? Because your mind naturally wanders to sin. Your heart naturally wanders. It's like a child. Our little daughter, Adeline, she uh, is seven months, she's, well, almost eight months, and she crawls, okay? And I've learned, or my wife and I have learned, that you always know where she's at. Because the moment you lose her, she wanders. And then you don't know where she's at, and she always gets into trouble. You know, you wonder, why, does, why doesn't a baby go to the safe place? You know, why, don't, why doesn't she crawl to the crib and climb in her crib and be safe, you know, with all of her toys? No, she's always got to climb and pull herself up on the table and about, you know, and try to grab the uh, the uh, the Tylenol bottle. <laughs> you know, the other day she had the the uh, the uh, uh, it was like a, a babe, uh, like Johnson's uh, what was that? Not soap. It was lotion. Yeah, she grabbed lotion. She took the top of the bottle off, unscrewed it, and everything. Remember? I couldn't believe it. I thought, what on earth? She's over there, you know, putting her hands in her mouth, and she's got. I was like, oh my goodness, you know my. In-laws are coming into town, and I'm like, great, I'm going to have to explain to them. Well, yeah, I let my daughter wander into lotion, you know, and I'm like, great. I'm thinking, man, great job, Dad. And uh, you know what I've learned? Don't let her wander because she'll wander into trouble. It's natural for, for us. We're sinners. We naturally wander towards trouble. God says, don't let your mind be, don't let your mind wander. Don't let your mind just sit and think about things that shouldn't be. Keep your mind in check. Keep your heart in check. Keep your thoughts on constantly on the Lord Jesus Christ. Because if you as a young person, if you as an adult, allow just for time to wander, you'll wander towards sin. You'll wander towards the things that you shouldn't think about. How do you keep your mind on the Lord? Well, memorize the Bible. Read the Word of God. Uh, keep yourself involved in God's Word, and that will help to keep your mind in check. Keep your mind on the Word of God. Maybe when a bad thought pops up, quote Scripture. Amen? Memorize the Bible. Memorize portions of Scripture that you constantly maybe quote, or, or you memorize a Scripture a month or something, but allow yourself to keep your mind in check with the Word of God. And lastly, number four. Don't be afraid to admit wrong. Be where you're supposed to be. Don't allow for idle time in your life. Don't let your mind wander. But don't be afraid to admit when you're wrong. Don't be afraid to go to God and say, God, I failed. What happens is we try to hide like David. We try to hide the sin. We try to hide the thought. No, the time you need God the most is when you've wandered maybe a little too far. Don't let it keep going. Don't let it build. You know, maybe you failed. Everybody does. Maybe you've done something you know you shouldn't have done. Then that's when you go to church. That's when you get down at the altar. 
That's when you confess to God and say, God, I've been a little idle in my life. I've wandered. I've let my mind be where it shouldn't be. But God, I'm, I'm going to admit that to you and get back on track. If David maybe would have just admitted the wrong, then God may have saved a child. If David would have admitted his wrong, then, God, or then we wouldn't see Uriah die in the latter portion of the, the chapter. It took a prophet... Bible says, chapter 12, verse 1, the Lord had to send Nathan to David and the, and the man of God had to rip him and point him out. And God had to judge David because of even not just adultery but murder. If you fail, if you do wrong, maybe you do allow yourself to be idle. Maybe you do fall into sin. Don't be afraid to get it right with God. Don't be afraid to get God involved and say, God, I failed. Now help me get back on track. Don't be afraid, young person, to go to a mom and dad and admit and say, Mom, Dad, I need help. Don't be afraid to go to your pastor as an adult and say, I need help. I've been idle. I've let my mind wander. I have some sin. Don't let it build. Admit the wrong. Get it right with God. And save more hurt down the road. Don't tarry at Jerusalem. Christian, have you, have you tarried in your life? Maybe, maybe sometimes uh, what happens is we just get a little complacent with ourselves. We just maybe uh, let little things go. David probably thought it's not a big deal to stay at Jerusalem this one time. And that was point number five, so let me give it to you. Point number five, make the little things a big deal. Make the little things a big deal. Sometimes we think, well, this is just a small thing. God will understand. No, God doesn't. God makes the big things a little deal in our life. The Bible says a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. God says a little sin leavens the whole lump. Don't let little things not be a big deal to you. Young person, don't let the little things become the, not the focus. Focus on the Bible reading in the morning. Focus on that reading the one chapter, if that's what you do. Focus on the time in prayer. Focus on that being in church. Focus on the one track, whatever it is, focus on the little things in the Christian life and don't allow those to become okay. Well, I'll just be a few minutes late. No, focus. Make it a big deal. Make it where it's the, that you don't want to be five minutes late this week because next week you'll be ten minutes late. And then the next week you'll be twenty minutes late. And then the next week you'll miss a service altogether because you don't let, don't let the little things get out of place. When God uh, had them design the temple, had Solomon design the temple, you read that even there were things that God had them to design that you never would have even seen. God put things in the walls of the temple. God put things behind where somebody may would never see them. But God wanted to teach the children of Israel that even though it may not seem insignificant to you, it meant something to God. God looks down and sees it. And God wants to know that it's there. There may be things in your life that people don't see. They're insignificant, you think, maybe to you, that God asks of you. But God sees it. God is the one that looks down when you're in the privacy of your home and sees what you do. God is the one that watches when you're by yourself and no one else is there. And God wants to see those little things. Christian, don't tarry at Jerusalem today. If you don't know that you're saved, if you don't know that you're born again, don't tarry in that decision. Don't let the devil make you think that you can tarry about the decision of being saved. Don't, make the devil, don't let the devil make you think that it's okay if you don't go this time, there's next week. No, there's an urgency of salvation. There's an urgency if you don't know that if you die that you're born again, Come forward today. Trust Christ as your Savior. Don't let the devil make you think that it's okay to wait. And Christian, don't let the devil make you think it's okay to wait 
on serving God, on weight in what you do for the Lord. Don't tarry at Jerusalem. Let's pray. Heavenly Father.